All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky, sponsored by Squarespace. And we're just two months away from 2022, so make sure you've got your 2022 What's in the Night Sky calendar. Features 12 of my images, and the dates of significant astronomical events are already pre-written into the calendar. There'll be a link down below. But coming up this month, we have a jam-packed month of astronomical events. So there's an opportunity to photograph Two comets, the first being Comet 67P, Trudium of Gerasimenko. We then have the peak of the Northern Taurus meteor shower. We have the peak of the Leonids meteor shower. There is a lunar occultation of Venus where the moon blocks Venus from view. And there's also a partial lunar eclipse, which is so close to being a total lunar eclipse. And there's also some really exciting news about Comet Leonard, which we've been waiting for since January at the start of this year. But before we deep dive into all of that and more, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is the place to host your website or online store, and I speak from personal experience as my website is hosted by Squarespace, and I've been a happy customer for years now. I use it to advertise and sell my workshops, my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets, and it's also where you can get the 2022 Night Sky Calendar. Squarespace handles all the payments, everything is automated, and it means I can spend more of my time doing things like taking photos and making videos for YouTube. You can also use Squarespace as a blog or even a host for your galleries and images which don't get compressed like they do on social media, so they look amazing. If you'd like to give Squarespace a try, head on over to squarespace.com forward slash Allen. Start with one of their award-winning templates, which you can customize to your heart's content. And then when you're happy to go ahead and make your website live, use the code Allen at the checkout for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name with Squarespace. Starting with a quick overview of the Northern Hemisphere night sky this month, you'll notice Ursa Major, the bear, still very low on the Northern horizon. Capella, the bright star in Auriga, is very obvious in the northeast. And as the night goes on and approaches midnight, you'll see the southernmost stars of Ursa Major beginning to make it above the horizon. Capella rising higher and higher into the eastern skies, along with the likes of Pleiades, the open star cluster, another star cluster, Hyades and Taurus, and of course, favorites like Orion with the Orion Nebula, Gemini, the twins, they're all starting to rise earlier now and we see as Sirius comes up above the horizon just after midnight the full winter circle asterism of stars now in the night sky. A beautiful region of the night sky with lots of bright stars and it just looks amazing with the star glow filter. And as the night progresses into the morning those constellations cross high into the south and arch across the southern horizon. Facing southwest in the evening skies, you'll notice a trio of planets. So you have Venus pretty low on the horizon in the evening sky, shining very bright at minus 4.4. Saturn at a more modest 0.6. And Jupiter still shining quite bright at minus 2.5. You'll also notice the great rift region of the Milky Way, a dark dust cloud standing almost vertically on the western horizon as we approach midnight and that begins to set leaving the bright fuzzy Cygnus region of the Milky Way in the west northwest. This is one of my favorite regions of the Milky Way. And if you look high in the sky in the late evening you notice M31 Andromeda, the spiral galaxy passing overhead. So a really good time of year to get the star tracker out and do some telephoto or telescope imagery of M31, the spiral galaxy. Onto the southern hemisphere and facing south towards the circumpolar constellations, as darkness falls, you'll notice that the Milky Way is pretty much parallel, 360 degrees around the horizon. Back to the south towards the circumpolar constellations, as the night goes on you'll see the small Magellanic Cloud and then the large Magellanic Cloud pretty high in the sky all night, so really good opportunity for the star trackers there. If I face a little bit more southeast, you'll notice the Milky Way 
beginning to arch over the eastern skies. So from the Crux constellation through Carina, Sirius and Canis Major, and then through the southern summer circle, Gemini, Orion, Taurus, and Riga, and down to the northern horizon. And if I just come back to the evening a little bit, you'll notice Andromeda, the spiral galaxy M31, arching across the northern horizon. And of course, the likes of Pleiades and Hyades, Orion with the Orion Nebula, California Nebula, all arching across the northern skies. Facing west in the evenings, you'll notice a trio of planets. So you have Venus shining incredibly bright at minus four, and then that's being followed by Saturn and Jupiter. Jupiter shining at minus 2.4, so very bright, and Saturn at a more modest 0.6. And as the night goes on, they all set onto the western horizon. As for conjunctions and close approaches this month, on the 7th you'll find a beautifully thin crescent moon and Venus in the evening skies. And those of you in Eastern Asia will get a chance to witness a lunar occultation of Venus where the moon passes in front of Venus and blocks it from view. There'll be a link in the description down below for more info on that. On the 10th is when the moon passes nearby Saturn, and a day later on the 11th is when it will pass by Jupiter. On to the special events this month. We have an opportunity to photograph a comet, Comet 67P churyumov Gerasimenko. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because that was the first comet that humans landed a spacecraft on. It was part of the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission, and in 2016, Philae, the lander module, left the spacecraft and made a successful landing on the comet, and it collected material to bring back to Earth. And we now have a chance to see and photograph that comet. So right at the start of the month, on November the 3rd, is when it reaches perihelion, which is its closest approach to the Sun on its orbit. But it's only four days later on November the 4th when the comet will be at its brightest. And it's predicted to be about magnitude plus eight. So it won't be naked eye visible because to be naked eye visible it needs to be at least plus six. But it should be easily accessible through binoculars, and average telescopes, and of course cameras on star trackers. You'll find it in the constellation Gemini, so it's visible from both the northern and southern hemisphere. Gemini rises in the late evening in the east-northeast, and it rises higher and higher into the south as the night goes on and into the early hours of the morning. As the comet continues on its journey, it reaches perigee, which is its closest approach to Earth on November the 13th. And as it continues to dim and fade, it passes from Gemini into the constellation Cancer. So certainly a good start to the month. And there's also lots of meteor activity to look forward to this month. So last month I talked about the southern Taurids, which peaked last month. This month it's time to focus on the northern Taurids. So the, the two Taurid meteor showers are stemming from the same debris, from the same comet, Comet 2P Enker but it's believed that stream of debris was split into two separate streams by perturbations in Jupiter's gravitational pull. So this gives rise to two separate meteor showers, the Northern Taurids and the Southern Taurids. The Southern Taurids continues to be active for like the first week of November. The Northern Taurids will be active for the entire month of November and into December. But it's expected to peak around the 11th to the 12th, where you'll only see, at most, a modest five meteors per hour. But it's not really a sharp peak, it's quite a broad peak uh, across the month. And where the Taurids lack in amount of meteors, they make up for in the ratio of fireballs. So a lot of Taurid meteors are fireballs, they're quite commonly referred to as Taurid fireballs. So the entire month, keep an eye out for really bright meteors that are shining brighter than Venus. As the radiant of the meteor shower is within Taurus, it's visible from both the northern and southern hemisphere as well. There's another meteor shower in November that normally offers uh, increased rates of activity compared to the Taurus, and that is the Leonid meteor shower. Now that has its radiant point in Leo, the lion, so again, 
visible from both the northern and southern hemisphere. And it's expected to peak around the 16th to the 17th, where normally you could hope for 15, maybe 25 meteors per hour. But sadly, this year that's timed with a bright waxing gibbous moon, which won't set until pretty much the pre-dawn hours. So you can expect the rates to be a lot lower this year. And the best opportunity will be those pre-dawn hours where the moon is beginning to set and it dims and fades. So still worth a try because the Leonids, although they're very fast moving meteors, a lot of them leave persistent trains. So vaporized gas leaving light in the sky for a couple of seconds after the meteor has passed. On the 18th to the 19th, where we have the full moon, there's also a partial lunar eclipse, and it's so close to being a total lunar eclipse. So a lunar eclipse occurs when the moon passes into Earth's shadow, which is being cast into space by the light of the sun. And Earth's shadow is split into two cone-shaped projections. So you have the umbral shadow, which is the inner, darker shadow where the, all of the light from the sun is being blocked. And then you have the outer penumbral shadow where only part of the sun's light is being blocked. For a lunar eclipse to be a total lunar eclipse, the entirety of the moon's disk needs to pass into the umbral shadow, the darker inner shadow. But for this eclipse, 97% of the lunar disk will pass into the umbral shadow. So it's still technically a partial lunar eclipse, but the moon should turn a nice gorgeous crimson red color like the blood moon you see in a total lunar eclipse, although technically it's not a, a blood moon. As you can see from the map on screen, those in Eastern Asia, Australia and New Zealand will be able to witness the eclipse at moon rise. Those in North America will be able to witness the eclipse in its entirety from start to finish. And those in South America, the UK, some Western European countries will be able to see the eclipse at moon set. Again, as usual, I'll put some links in the video description down below. So check those out for some more in detail information for your location. And in other comet news, Comet Leonard is looking pretty promising. Now, we've been waiting for this comet since it was discovered in January at the start of this year. And professional astronomers have already began photographing the comet and it's showing a coma and a decent little dust tail. So things are looking really promising. And if things continue promisingly, we could see a naked eye visible comet in the sky next month. So things won't really get interesting until December. So I'll talk about Comet Leonard in more detail in next month's video. So make sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on that information. And of course, by then, we'll have a bit of a better idea of what to expect from Comet Leonard. But you should be able to easily catch a glimpse of the comet towards the end of this month. For now, it's only accessible for Northern Hemisphere dwellers, although those in the Southern Hemisphere will get a chance to see the comet in the latter half of December and January. For now, at the end of November, the comet can be found passing through the constellation Coma Berenices, and that rises in the northeast in the pre-dawn hours. It's not very far away from Ursa Major, and it should be easily spotable with binoculars, basic telescopes, and of course with cameras and star trackers. So, fingers crossed, we have another naked eye visible comet at the end of the year. Now onto the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject or theme for people to photograph and then upload the images to social media using the hashtag Wittens. I then pick my favorite three for a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a What's in the Night Sky t-shirt. And first place wins a Photo View Photography Guidebook of their choice. And this month, I'm also going to give all the winners a copy of the 2022 Night Sky Calendar. Last month's theme was meteors, as we're at the peak of sort of meteor season now. And there were some really amazing entries. So in third place was Nord Astro, with this lovely image of a green meteor, and also coupled with Pleiades, the open star cluster. In second place was Bonsai Bri with this image of Andromeda M31, the spiral galaxy. And as you can see, it was photobombed by a nice little meteor. Thought that was really cool. 
And in first place was this image by One-Eyed Lama of a pretty decent looking meteor in a window through the clouds. But if you head on over to One-Eyed Lama's profile and see the consecutive images after this photo, you'll see the vapor train that was left behind in the wake of this meteor. There's another four or five images that are definitely worth going over and checking out. So well done to all the winners. This month, with so many special events going on, I'll accept images from any of the special events. So images of Comet 67P, Comet Leonard, the Torrid Meteor Shower, the Leonid Meteor Shower, the Lunar Eclipse, the Venus Occultation, any of those I will accept. So thanks for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies. Thank you.